Well, hello and welcome to a, another video from me. You probably guessed from the introduction exactly what I'm reviewing today, and that is the Insta360 ONE RS one inch edition. Uh, Insta360 were kind enough to send this camera out to me, so uh, a big thanks goes out to them. Uh, but all the opinions I'm gonna give on this are my own, and you know I can sometimes be opinionated. Um, but cut a long story short, I've been very, very, very impressed with this camera. Um, I'm not gonna do a full on unboxings, I'm not a big fan of unboxings really, uh, but what they've sent out is the Insta360. is the Insta360 ONE RS camera itself. Um, we'll have a little bit of a closer look at that later on and how it all works. Uh, they've also got a really, really, really sturdily, well-built uh, selfie stick, which is, uh, yeah, handy, uh, especially when you're doing sort of walking video and stuff like that. And also a little uh, tabletop tripod, which has got a nice little, extendable legs on it, which, uh, yeah, I like that. It's really, really good. And again, fantastic build quality, um, made of metal. Uh, a lot of these are plastic. So, uh, yeah, very, very good. Um, so I'm going to put these bits down here just to get them out of the way. Uh, so many of you know that I am predominantly a mirrorless 360 shooter have been for years. Uh, however, one shot cameras are getting better and better and better and better now. Um, this particular camera has got the dual lens setup, uh, like a lot of other 360 cameras do. Um, however, it benefits from having Leica glass for a start, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and also it has got that one inch sensor as well. So, you know, a bigger sensor means that it's going to be able to gather more light, the quality is going to be better, things like the contrast is going to be better, things like that. So this video itself is going to be predominantly focused around photography, 360 photography. The reason for that is because Insta360 are seen as the pioneers of 360 video and that is 100% true. And um, you know, as I say, previous Insta360 cameras that I've used on the photo side of things have been, eh, okay. Um, this one is different, but the video on this is absolutely mind-blowing as well. So I think that deserves a separate video. Uh, also, I'm not a massive video shooter, to be honest with you. Uh, so it's going to take me, you know, just I want to get used to it a little bit more, play around with it a little bit more, and then do another video for you, for you on, the, uh, on the video side of things. But I think there aren't many videos out there focusing on the photography capabilities of this camera. And I think a lot of virtual tour photographers or 360 photographers do tend to lean towards the photography side as opposed to the video side. Yes, you can create some absolutely mind-bending content with this thing, video-wise. Uh, the effects that you can do are fantastic. Um, but as I say, there's a, there's, there's a lot to it. You know, the creativity side of things and, uh, and there's quite a few different settings and so on and so forth. So. Don't worry, I will be doing another video on that, which I'm quite excited about. But for now, I wanted to focus on the photography side. Okay, so what we're gonna do is I'm going to show you how the camera works. Um, most of it is controlled from the Insta360 app, which is a fantastic app, by the way, very, very well built. Uh, so I wanted to show you a couple of different ways of using it for 360 photography. And then what we'll do is we're gonna jump onto the computer and edit some photos put them together, put them into a tour, and um, yeah, all that sort of good stuff. So without further ado, let's have a quick look at the setup of the Insta360 ONE RS one inch and see what we can do with it. So here we are with the Insta360 ONE RS one inch edition. Um, I've currently got the camera set up on a light stand. Um, the reason why I like using light stands is because this center column here is incredibly thin. Uh, so what that means is that when you extend the center column really high, it's really far away from the feet at the bottom, which gives you a minimal nadir imprint. And also with a light stand, uh, you can spread the feet out at the bottom with the base of the stand touching the floor. So if you're on a level surface, then it means, just gives you the peace of mind that the camera is completely flat uh, or level. Uh, most of these cameras, including this one, have got a self-leveling feature in them anyway. 
Um, but should that not work, uh, or you want to adjust it slightly, uh, then you can do that in, in like stitching software like PC GUI or something like that. Uh, you will probably find that sometimes you need to do that if you're shooting on grass with a light stand or on a driveway that's sloped or something like that. So, uh, so yeah, but most of the time you'll find that your images are completely flat. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get the camera turned on. Bing, there we go. Now the one thing I absolutely love about this is the display on the front. Um, having a display on the front of the camera means that if you haven't got it connected to the app, which most of the time I do, um, but if I'm out and about on, on a trip away or something like that and I don't want to get my phone out, then I can just have a quick peek at the screen uh, and just check that the exposure's right and all that sort of stuff and so on and so forth. So uh, it's really, really handy having that. The menu system is excellent as well. Uh, really, really, really good. Um, just the ability just to sort of swipe up and down uh, to bring up different menus. It did take me a while to uh, get used to sort of what each swipe does because there's basically four, up, you know, up, down, left, right. Uh, but after a while, you know, you, you get used to it and there's tons and tons of different modes that you can choose from on there. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this video is going to be mainly based around 360 photography. As we all know, Insta360 are pioneers of 360 video. Uh, they always have been. Uh, but being very honest, apart from this camera, previous Insta360 cameras that I've used for photography haven't quite been up there. But this one here has, yeah, impressed me a lot. Uh, so what we're going to do is just have a look at a, a couple of ways of shooting 360 photos with it. So what I'm going to do is get my phone out here. Uh, I'm just going to open up the Insta360 app. And... Tap the screen to make sure we're there. Yep, all good. Uh, and just gonna click connect now. Um, it's another great thing with this is that it connects really, really easily. It's an absolute doddle. You don't have to go into uh, sort of swipe down to Wi-Fi settings all the time and connect and then come back out and back into the app. It just, you just click connect device. It will come up with a thing saying join a temporary network. Click that, job done. So I'm connected now, which is great. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna record my screen just so you can see what I'm doing because as I said there's two ways I feel that you can shoot with this camera when it comes to 360 photography. Uh, there's the quick way uh, which gives you good results or there's the slightly longer way which gives you even better results. So we're going to go through both of those. The first one that I'm going to show you um, you've got photo here and then you've got HDR photo. So that's the one that we're gonna focus on first of all. Uh, I have taken some photos in this room and a couple of others previously. So when you see the images and we sort of do the editing and everything, there won't be the camera in it and me and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the first mode here is HDR photo. So the HDR or the auto HDR in here is brilliant. It's very, very, very impressive. Um, so if we go to the top here, you've got something called Pure Shot. Uh, so that will basically uh, kind of edit the photo for you automatically. So you can either do pure shot or just a plain JPEG when you're doing HDR. Um, I would always recommend just using pure shot. Um, really good for sort of on the go, run and gun photography, just to make sure you've got all that dynamic range in there. Um, and then also you've got the settings, which gives you the ability to change the uh, timer. So this can go all the way up to 15 seconds. I'm just gonna leave it at five because I've, I've, as I say, I've already taken these photos. So um, then you can also change the, uh, the brackets that you need. Now this thing does do a lot of brackets. It goes up to nine brackets, which is quite extreme. Um, I personally wouldn't use that. I think um, five is good. Um, but it was light like this today. I mean, it's reasonably overcast outside. Um, you could probably just get away with three. And then here you can change the EV spacing. So this is telling me now that it's going to be two stops apart. So one shot, two stops underexposed, one shot normally exposed, and then one shot, two stops overexposed. Um, so let's leave it at that. Um, and then all you do, click the button, does a little countdown. And there we go, it's taken the photo, okay? Um, now, the other option that you can do, which I think works much better, it does take a little bit more time and it does 
involve having uh, an extra piece of software is manually exposing the images. Now, I did a video a while back and this is included in my 360 photography training course as well. Um, if you haven't seen that course, then I'll put a link to that in the notes below. It basically revolves around taking your images and exposing the images manually. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna switch over to photo mode here. And then if I come up to the top, you can still shoot in pure shot mode if you want, um, but what I would recommend doing is shooting in JPEG and RAW. Um, because what the aim of this is, if I click here, again, you can go onto auto exposure if you want to. Don't do that. Um, what we want to be doing is manually exposing our images. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to go to the ISO and I'm going to drop that down to 100, basically the lowest ISO possible. Um, and then white balance, you can just leave it on auto because we're shooting in raw, we can adjust that in post-production. So what we want to do here is go to the shutter speed. And again, this is the benefit of using the phone um, because I can preview this on the screen. So you can uh, see my camera there. Um, but what we want to do is we want to be exposing for this outdoor, outdoor area here, okay? Because at the moment you can see it's completely blown out. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to the settings here and I'm just going to increase the shutter speed, okay? Until we can see a good exposure outside just like so then i'm going to take the picture two one done okay so that's shot one what we want to do next is we want to adjust that shutter speed okay so if i come into the settings again two three four five I normally find around five or six clicks um, works well. So now if we have a look here, we can see that we are still slightly overexposed outside. Uh, we should be able to recover some of those details because we're shooting in raw. Um, so this is basically for a middle exposure, okay? We're not exposing for the sky outside or the shadows indoors. Um, we're kind of in the middle here. So what I'm gonna do, take another shot. There we go, that's one more. Um, and then next, we want to come back onto the settings again and increase the ex exposure to a brighter so we can start seeing the inside of the room here, okay? So we can see that this window here now, um, just here is completely, completely blown out. You can't see outside there. Uh, this might be a little bit too bright because what we don't want to do is we don't want to go so bright that we start seeing what's called bloom around the windows, that sort of ghosting around the windows here. You don't want that. So um, if we go to say 1 60th, I think that would be, all right, let's risk it. Let's live life on the edge. Let's go to 1 50th. Um, push, click the button. And then that is our third shot done. Of course, you can do five if you want to. This is why the benefit is here of shooting manually. So if you have got a really, really, really sunny day outside with blue sky, um, I would recommend doing five shots. So exposing the, your, your, your darkest shot for the blue sky and then lighten it up a bit so you can see more of the, the grass and stuff outside in the garden and then a bit more and then so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what we do uh, with the sort of the more manual method. What we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the differences once we jump up onto the computer of those two methods. So we'll see the results of the Insta360 HDR shot. And then what we'll do is we'll process the, those three separate images independently in Lightroom and also in SNS HDR, which is the HDR software of my choice. I think it's probably one of the best ones out there, to be honest. Uh, again, I'll link to my review video of that in the description below. And we'll just compare the differences. Um, the great thing with this is because it's got like a glass in it and it's got a one inch sensor, uh, the images are pretty sharp. Um, there is stuff that you can do and we'll probably play around with that a little bit using um, some other software. Uh, also, I'm not trying to get you to all go out there and buy tons and tons and tons of software. You don't have to. It's just if you want to get the best out of these cameras and you've chosen to shoot with a one-shot camera, then you will need some extra software just to get the best out of this. So what we're going to do next is we're going to head up onto the computer. 
we're going to go through all the images, do some editing, have some fun with it, and um, see what sort of results we can get. So let's head upstairs. Okay, so here we are in Insta360 Studio. Um, what I wanted to do here is basically just uh, export a few different file types just to show you through the different results that you can get. Uh, the great thing with the Insta360 One RS One Inch is that it gives you a great amount of choice over how you export images. Um, for example, here, you can see in the top left corner here, it says HDR. Um, so if you hover over it, it goes away, but that's really handy to see that which images are HDR and which ones are, let's go down, raw, for example, here, this one here. Um, but if I click on this one, you can see at the bottom here, you've got all of the different exposures that the camera took. So what you can do is you can export all those five different exposures, but what I find is sometimes they're just a bit too bright. Like, do you remember I spoke about blooming earlier on? Um, the bloom around the windows here is quite bad, uh, which is why I personally prefer to, to bracket the images manually. Um, obviously, I do that when I'm shooting with a DSLR mirrorless camera, so I feel it should be done with a, with a one-shot camera as well. However, in a pinch, obviously, yes, go for it. You know, you can just, just click the HDR mode and this camera generally creates absolutely incredible results. Um, so we'll have a look at the different results in a second. Um, but when you, go, when you come to export, if I just click on the, this button in the bottom right-hand corner here, it gives you the option to export this exact image as a merged photo in JPEG. So if you're happy with this result, export it as a JPEG, um, or you can export it as a DNG, uh, or you can export all the exposures individually. Now it's really great that they give you that option because as I say, if you do use an, an, a, a separate HDR software like I do, um, as I say, I use SNS HDR to do all of my HDR uh, sort of blending. Uh, I do go into a lot more detail about uh, the editing process and HDR blending in the training course. So don't forget there's a link for that in the description below. Um, but what I wanted to really show you here is just the differences between the uh, just a few of the types that you can export from here. So what I'll do is I'll open up Lightroom and I've got three different types here. So first of all, I've got the, the JPEG. So I personally think the results of this are brilliant, um, absolutely brilliant. Uh, there is a bit of sort of color issues on the walls and things like that, but that generally you tend to find you get that quite a lot just with the JPEG. And which is why it is good to, to edit in more when you can. Um, but I've also got the DNG image. So if I just, what I normally do with these, because you can see outside here is completely blown out and this ghosting has basically come from that brighter image on the outside of the window here. So if I reduce the highlights completely, we can see we've got a lot of control here um, of, the, of the highlights in this DNG file and then boost up the shadows. I'm going to boost them quite far and then I'm just going to slowly raise this exposure until the outdoor exposure is looking a little bit too bright and I think that's as far as we're going to be able to go with that. Let's try and push it a bit more. No. There we go. I think here and um, we can also obviously just increase the whites ever so slightly from here but you can see that we're starting to get a little bit blown out on the exterior here. Now what I did is I took the three separate exposures that I took earlier on um, and I blended them in SNS HDR and the result that we got is this, okay? Now you can see straight away um, that we haven't got any of the color casting issues and we've got a nice balanced exposure. The outdoors is looking really, really nice and well exposed, you can even see sort of the dormer window at the top here, which is great. Whereas if we go back to the JPEG, for example, everything's starting to look a little bit blown out. And then in the DNG, it's even it's even brighter. Um, but that's why I think that the, the, the use case for DNG is just to give you sort of more control over your shadows and highlights. But when you're doing a, a, a scene like this, which was quite dark inside and pretty bright outside, that's when you want to start looking at, uh, at manually merging your HDR images, which you can do in Lightroom as well if you wanted to, um, but the result 
isn't quite as good, okay? So we can, we've still got plenty of room to play with in this Im image here. So if we, we can just drag, if you want to make it a little bit brighter inside, you can, and then just pull the, the highlights down a bit more outside. Um, and then we can just take those blacks down ever so slightly. And then you can always, if you wanted to brighten up certain areas within the room, we can always just click K on the keyboard, which brings up our brush tool. Uh, and then we can just paint in a bit of exposure into the room just to brighten up sort of key parts in the room, for example, the kitchen. You have got to be very careful with a 360 image when you're doing this though, because you don't want to go over the edges. So if I just click O to bring up the overlay, we can see that we haven't quite gone over the edge here, but if we do, you will get a stitch line um, when you view this image in 360. So um, I always, just to be, just to be careful, I just hold down the Alt key or Option key, I think it's on the Mac, and just delete the edges here, uh, just to make doubly sure, okay? Um, so we can see that that result is very, very good. Um, I think you'd agree as compared to sort of the JPEG, which is quite a lot darker. I tend to lean towards quite sort of bright, airy images myself. Um, but yeah, I think this goes to show you that when you do take your images manually, you can be rewarded with a better, better result. Okay. So what I wanted to show you very quickly now is just how to get just that little bit more out of these images. Um, by using Topaz software. Um, I've got all the different Topaz products. I've had them for years and years and years. And I think for when it comes to uh, one shot 360 photography, Topaz can give you just that little bit of extra quality um, that you want with your 360 images. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use Topaz Sharpen. Um, they have got a number of different ones that you can use. Uh, Topaz Gigapixel is also a good choice, but I do sometimes find that with Topaz Gigapixel, it does leave some artifacts in place. And what that will do, Gigapixel, is it will basically boost the resolution of your photos. So this one was about, I think, from memory, about 6,500 pixels wide. If you doubled that, it would go to 13,000 pixels wide. Um, but it's not truly 13,000 pixels, it's just faking that, as to say. So I personally find it better to sharpen images as opposed to boosting the resolution of the images. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just find an image here and I'm going to drag it in to Topaz Sharpen and see what sort of results we can get. So um, you see here that's automatically said that it's too soft. So if we just switch this little toggle on here, and this is the sort of the AI toggle, as to say, what it's done is it's, it's recognized that it needs standard sharpening. All right, so we'll just let it do its thing in the bottom right hand corner here. It's reasonably quick. Uh, it does depend on, on sort of the power of your computer and all that sort of stuff, but uh, generally it, uh, it's reasonably fast. There we go, it's all done. So if we start dragging across, we'll see that the image is gonna get a lot sharper. Uh, sometimes it can overdo it slightly, um, but I think that's done a pretty good job. Uh, when you do zoom in, it does have to update again, which is fine. Just has to re-render it for you, but I think we've got a pretty good result here. So let's take a look. Yeah, you can see in that light, for example, it's uh, looking much, much, much sharper. And I think possibly a little bit too sharp. So what you can do here, is um, you can change the sharper model. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of them, but you know it's it's good just to just to go through uh, each of each of the different ones and see how uh, what sort of results you get. Um, so yeah, as I say, I would highly, highly, highly recommend Topaz products. Uh, the sharpen one on its own, I think, is from memory. I think it's about eighty bucks, eighty dollars or something like that. Uh, so it's worth every penny for for the amount that you're going to use it. Um, again, I'll pop a link to Topaz uh, with everything else in the description below for you. 
Um, I would appreciate it if people can use those links. Uh, obviously, you know, creating these YouTube videos does take quite a bit of time, so it just helps to give me a little bit of income from that. So uh, yeah, it would be much appreciated. So what we're gonna do now is I'm going to uh, edit the rest of these photos in Topaz Sharpen, and then I'm just gonna jump over into 3D Vista just to show you how they look when they're sort of composed into, into a virtual tour. So let's head over there now. Okay, so um, this last part's gonna be quite quick, but I just uh, wanted to show you um, how to get the images into a virtual tour um, and how they will look, because that's basically the, the end goal, isn't it really? Uh, for us to create a virtual tour for some company or someone. Um, so I'm just going to pick a, just a standard skin here. Um, yeah, I'll just use that one. Uh, you can uh, with 3D Vista. A lot of you know I've been using this software for years and years and years. Um, but this is quite good because they have got a ton of sort of pre-made skins in here ready for you to use, which is great. So uh, I'll just select this one here. And then I will import some panoramas into here. So let's do import. Right, so we're just going to use those three images. And they're just going to load them into here. So we've got our front one, we've got the kitchen, and we've got the living room. Now, I'm just going to reorganize these very quickly. There we go, because that comes before there. And so let's open up this front one. There we go. And we can navigate into the, I haven't done the hallway, but we're just going to go straight into the living room. That's not particularly right, but we'll just go back out to the front from there. And then the living room. We'll head into the kitchen. And then back into the living room there. Right, so if I just click on preview. So here we go. So let's head into that. Excellent. So you can see that the you know in a in a finished tour, it's um it really is very, very impressive quality, this camera. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, I've been incredibly impressed with it. So I thought, oh, there you, there you can see it there. Now, if you do want to get rid of any of this stuff here, um, like that or yeah, that there, then yeah, Affinity Photos, your way to go. So, uh, and then we'll head over into Kitchen. Job done. So that just leaves me to head back to the office for some final words. Well, there we go. Uh, I hope that was interesting and informative and all that sort of stuff. Uh, again, I've been really, really blown away by this thing. It's, uh, it's an absolutely fantastic all-round camera. Um, the ability to do some really, really amazing 360 photos and also the video side as well. Um, as I promised, I will be doing a video on the video side of things, <laughs> if that makes sense. So if I could ask you to hit that like button and if you do want to subscribe then please do that way obviously you'll be notified when the uh, the video review of the video side of things goes live um, so yeah hit the subscribe button don't forget to turn on the bell to be notified of the, all the notifications and that just leaves me to say thanks very much again and I shall speak to you all again soon take care